Uh, welcome. Hi. If you don't want to be filmed, put your hands up and we will, I don't know, put a carrot over your face or something. Put your hands up if you don't want to be filmed. You're at the fucking front. <laughs> All right. We will. <laughs> um, there is a bar. There's food. If you go and get drinks during it, just uh, try and uh, keep quiet and don't disrupt everyone. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a big shout out to the, our lead sponsor who've paid for this. Um, so I don't know if anyone notices. We have a new lead sponsor. They're called Iris Energy. Uh, You've probably heard me say this. They are the largest NASDAQ listed Bitcoin miner using 100% renewable energy. But I just want to just give them a big shout out. It's very cool. They got in touch with me and Danny a few months ago. They said, look, we're interested in sponsoring the podcast. Uh, what do you want to do? And so we got on the phone to them. Uh, we went out to Canada, met them. They took us snowboarding for the day. And they said, what do you want to do? And we said, well, we want to do the podcast. And they said, well, anything else? And he said, yeah, we want to do a bunch of live events. And they said, anything else? And we said, well, we want to make more f films and, and get this football club promoted again. So everything we said we wanted to do, they said, we back you 100%. Uh, they're great guys. I think some of them are here somewhere. If you get a chance to meet them, say hello. Um, but I just want to say a big shout out to them. Thank them for everything they're doing. Actually, and they're an amazing business. Go and check them out. All right. So have I forgotten anything? You got everything. Who knows Danny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! <laughs> Star of the show. Who watched the Sailor interview today? We have Connor at the back there. Cameraman. We'll call Mac Jr. in the house. We also have Emma here. Emma Wave. Emma pulls all this together thanks to her. And we also have Austin here. Where's Austin? Austin's here somewhere. Austin's at the back. So the whole team's here apart, apart from Ben, who's had a baby, so we miss him. But anyway, we're going to get on with this. Danny, you'll keep the time. Danny will throw some questions in. And Good to see you, Harry. How are you? No bad days in Bitcoin. Troy, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, thanks for you both coming. Okay, so uh, this is essentially a mining session. Obviously, uh, Harry works for Grid. We have uh, Troy here, who just works on a range of things. Um, so... One of the things I found super interesting is over the last six years since we're doing the podcast, uh, when I first started, mining wasn't anything I really paid attention to. It's just like this weird group of people with these machines out in Kazakhstan who secured the network. I paid no attention to it for, for a good few years. And then all of a sudden, it's the miners who are leading the game of Bitcoin. They are kind of running the show. They're, they've got some of the most interesting companies. Uh, they are publicly listed. They're driving a huge amount of innovation, things we didn't even know were going to happen, some crazy shit. I mean, you've been in it for a while, Harry. What do you make of all this? Um, well, for, first and foremost, I think we need to help everybody here and listening understand just how not sexy mining was in yeah. 2018 and 19 and, like, just how weird and crazy it was and, and how, you know, we're, we're coming off of eight to ten years of this being, like, a deeply hobbyist, like really in your basement kind of, not a business, but but truly a hobby, right? Providing hash rate to the Bitcoin network was not a professional activity. It was like barely an altruistic activity. And, and you know, that, that was really a function of a couple of things. But, you know, the first is that um, Bitcoin wasn't very valuable for a long time, which, which we've somehow forgotten. Um, you know, Bitcoin was was freedom technology and privacy technology, and and it was foundationally useful in all of those ways before anybody figured out that they wanted to trade a lot of U.S. dollars for one. Um, and so, you know, the mining industry was born out of that ethos. And so, there, you know, a huge number of of folks running nodes and mining nodes on PCs. You know, that's what bootstrapped Bitcoin from the beginning. So we thank them for their energy service, um, even though they've, they've achieved fabulous wealth since then, they, they deserve every Satoshi. Um, we've come a long way since then, and, and really the professionalization of the mining industry is something that um, I kind of trip fell and, and landed in. You know, I've, I'm not an energy guy, I'm not a data center guy, I'm, I'm barely a Bitcoin guy at the time that I got into it, but, um, but really, I felt an enormous center of gravity around providing proof of work to the Bitcoin network and taking on that role, taking on you know what what we at Grid and what every miner I've ever talked to 
takes as a, a foundational responsibility, a, a deadly serious responsibility, which is if we want this thing to work, we have to participate and we have to participate aggressively and competitively and honestly. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really exciting for me to see the transfer from, you know, what, what the best we could do was, you know, plugging in like 800 F F FPGAs to like, you know, our, our father-in-law's warehouse <laughs> to today, you know, where we're, we're signing some of the largest energy contracts in America. We're building the backbone of our electric systems day by day. We're integrating across, you know, core human infrastructure. So getting to build a business at the intersection of energy and money, you know, it, it's the dream of a lifetime. How about you, Troy? You're the, uh, yeah, yeah. Woo! Woo! And Troy, you're, you're at the forefront of some of the most exciting things that are happening at mining. Things that, uh, apart from Hal Finney, nobody really thought about. What it was, and you can't also, Troy's just like come out of nowhere and become this superstar. Rocket ship. Yeah. <laughs> What's well, it been like for you? Um, yeah, well, first of all, it's really, great to be here and uh, be with friends and talk about something that has absorbed my life that I feel passionate about and with people doing it well who I really uh, admire tremendously. Um, I've been thinking about the, biz the business of Bitcoin mining as just truly unique. As on the Uber over here, I had this picture in my head. It just sort of floated in uh, just before I arrived of uh, like a Petri dish and a, a, a culture in the Petri dish like expanding rapidly out to the edge of the dish. And then I was like interpreting the image and it's like, this is Bitcoin mining. The Petri dish is the block reward. The culture is mining and it's just gonna run right out to the edge of that until it starves and um, reaches its limits. It's, it's ecology, it's population dynamics. And um, Bitcoin mining is so in a way perfectly formal. I'm a philosopher, an academic philosopher. You can think about it at this very high abstract level like the Petri dish, you know exactly what, in some sense, you know exactly what is gonna happen with the, the block subsidy. You don't know what's gonna happen with fees, but you can put, sort of project that it's gonna be a perfect competition to get that block reward, whatever it is, everybody's running the same miners, everybody's got the same tool, and these little marginal differences on how you operate are gonna make all the difference. And also, it's a, it's a zero-sum game, in a way, for all the miners, so it's a fascinating space, not just sort of philosophically and theoretically, but personally, to know what kind of person sees like the having year off and is like, I want in, you know? <laughs> like, 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 you know, I mean, like, I, I, like, it's just this loom, looming thing, it's this looming thing where you're, you know, the major part of your revenue up until recently is, is gonna drop in half across the industry and people are like, yeah, it's time to expand. You know, if you don't expand, you die. And it's like, what kind of a human being does this? And, and, and then, I, and I think they're very courageous individuals and risk-taking individuals. And look, they've been right uh, in, the, in the past. And not all of them, <laughs> but they've been, they've been right. And, uh, and, and so to me, it's like a, one of the most uh, amazing examples of like capitalism in its rawest, purest form. Almost purer than any... Bring your mic up Sorry, to your mouth. Almost purer than any kind of form that appears in nature where you have a, uh, you know, so, so much randomness in how well you do. This is such a pure competition and it draws a certain kind of person where everybody's like, everybody I talk to in mining is like, yeah, we're expanding. And I say, what, what about the having? You know, I, I'm, I'm a somewhat cautious person. And, uh, and they say, yeah, but our power, our power price is really really good you know and it's like <laughs> i'm like yeah but if you talk to everybody else they're telling me the same they're telling me the same thing you know <laughs> like you know, uh, uh, and then it's like yeah but bitcoin you know it's bitcoin and it's just it's like this raw like it's like yeah it's bitcoin and it, it, no further explanation it means what it means like that maybe price goes maybe the number goes up look it's it's the having number has gone up before in the having another thing it means is maybe we get a black swan, like a disruption in the fee market that suddenly lifts all boats that nobody expects. And it occurs to me that in Bitcoin, this is the other part of the capitalism thing, in Bitcoin mining, it's, it's, a, it's all about risk and, and, and reward. What you're really betting on are these black swan type events, 
like a bubble in price where nobody can get a hold of ASICs and uh, you, can, you can print money hand over fist during that period. And you're betting on the probability of that event happening, you know? So it's, it's, it's operationally, are you better than other people? But it's also like, will this black swan type event happen and miners keep kind of getting it right as prices double with, or more with each halving and as we get disruptions in the fee market. So I'm a bystander, I'm, a, I'm an onlooker, but I'm also, I'm just sort of fascinated by the kind of person and the dynamic uh, that mining is. And of course I think about it, like where does this go? Where does this kind of person and this kind of industry unleashed on the world, the world of energy and resources and states, what does that look like? Because like you were saying, Peter, that you know this, this era doesn't resemble previous eras. Well, guess what? The next era does not resemble this era. We're gonna have this conversation two halvings down the line and it's going to be like a complete, it'd be like, remember how completely naive and simplistic we were <laughs> this time right now? It's going to keep changing. It, it's going to keep changing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Harry, you know, in a world where we have uh, a lot of meddling and interference from uh, governments and regulators, uh, what does Bitcoin mining teach us about markets? Oh, oh I mean, I, B Bitcoin mining is just the ultimate teacher, right? You know, Troy talks about what, what kind of person does this for a living, and um, I suppose that I'm one of them. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that means other than, you know, if we just take a step back to, like, why, why do we mine and, and what, what's the thought process there? Um, you know, it, it really kind of dials back to like a little glass room in 2018 and 2019 when we thought about the business and we said, you know, all right, we're, we're going to be structurally long Bitcoin and Bitcoin usage and structurally short power markets and hash rate. Um, and that sounds like a terrifying bet to take on the face of it. But the good news is, is that by taking a bet like that, you're compressing an enormous amount of biz normal business risk into this one very specific perspective. Um, and so, you know, what, what has emerged is, you know, that mining, is, you know, Bitcoin is a black hole and, and that's a, a conversation from a different day. But, you know, Bitcoin is a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's just like this, this hyper kind of center of mass that drags sort of economic utility into it um, and spits it out on the other side in, in its most efficient form. And I see, my, you know, mining as a total microcosm of that same dynamic where, you know, Bitcoin mining is a buzzsaw that's getting taken to a dead oak forest that hasn't been touched in 200 years. Um, and so, you know, uh, maybe the environmentalists don't. It's <laughs> dead oak. Okay, okay. okay. Live oak, we leave and grow and sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Um, <laughs> Or better yet, we plant new forests. Um, but, but you know, really what, what's so exciting about getting to kind of run this buzzsaw into untouched markets is like, it's a dumb example, but I think it's really material. But, you know, if you go to everybody who's here who came on an airplane, you charged your phone at the airport probably at some point. The, the cost to install those outlets is like $600 per unit. And let's just use unit, one unit for the sake of the argument. To install one of the same units at a Bitcoin mine costs between $100 and $150. And so we've seen between a 75 and an 80% cost savings on delivering electricity to an outlet. Why? Because Bitcoin miners care a lot about making their builds cheaper. And no other industry thought to shave that $450 out of it because it's not a big line item. It's not worth a lot of attention. There's no driving urgent market force asking those businesses to cut that cost. But, you know, then when you look at our business, we've got to install that like 32,000 times. And so 32,000 times 450 is a lot of money. And it's probably the difference between one miner being able to operate through the halving versus another. And so every time I see a one, two, three, five percent incremental opportunity, I want to go kill it, right? Like I want to, I want to go take, take, you know, deep and urgent violence to the opportunity set. Um, and every miner thinks that way. And so 
these are the people who are reading through power agreements. These are the people who are looking at generation assets. These are the people who are looking to convert waste into use. Um, and so you take an army of these businesses operating all across the world, and, and all of a sudden there's a lot of efficiency gains that get delivered. And so while I've solved the problem with the $450 savings at the outlet, that's actually a benefit that's now gonna get propagated across an entire economy. And so this is how innovation delivering value works, is one business is presented an urgent need, and then every business gets to eat that benefit over some you know, dispersion field of time. And so like, this, is, this is why you know, Bit, everything is good for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a black hole. It's gonna suck in all of these, these sort of positive sum economies of scale over time. And, and you know, we're, gonna, we're, gonna make, we're gonna make it. I think it's about 1.6 million, you, or was it 16 million you saved with that? It's a lot. A lot of outlets. Which, uh, I'll tell you one more anecdote from early grid. So uh, our CEO and founder, Trey Kelly, and I, we are not electrical engineers or electricians. And so we, like, conceptually knew what we were going to build when we were going to build a Bitcoin mine. But, like, our view of that was, like, we kind of need 3,000 outlets, and we're going to plug them in. And we had no idea what happens, like, behind the 3,000 outlets. <laughs> And so we had to go through this very rapid and urgent education process. And thankfully, we hired some incredible, incredible people along the way. Um, but like, that was four and a half years ago. And so like, the, the learning curve is just like unbelievably steep for all of this stuff. And, and we're all starting basically at zero in, in our own different way. And so like, the, like if, you, if you're interested in any of this or interested in something else in Bitcoin, like, just start. Right? Nobody knew anything before they started. I still don't know anything. We know. <laughs> okay. So, so one, I, one of the things I found most interesting over the last certainly couple of years is that uh, we've had these new cohorts of people coming into Bitcoin. It's just not uh, crazy psychos anymore. We've got very smart group of philosophers who've joined us in the world also, of Bitcoin. Also crazy psychos. Yeah, but in a different way. Like, uh, <laughs> like uh, gentle psychos. And... Uh, they're you know, the dangerous I, kind. Yeah. Uh, and I've uh, really enjoyed getting to know Troy and you know, his mafia of philosophers. But as a philosopher, how do, you, how do you think about mining? Does it present like a new weird ways of thinking about the world? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, mean, I mean, Bitcoin does and mining is in, inextricably connected with it. I mean, of course, it's pushed me to thinking about the relation generally between energy and money. I think money always finds its way into energy at some stage or another. Mining is just a particularly direct path for it. But I wanted to uh, riff on something that um, Harry said uh, and, and also answer your question in the sense that I, I think like the, the philosopher level view, which is not only do you not understand what happens behind the plugs, but like you don't even think about the number of plugs or anything, you know? <laughs> the philosopher level view is it's a brutal competition Ruthless competition for a fixed fixed reward, and 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 seventy percent of of the cost is power, and so humanity is witnessing um, a search for cheap power like it never has before, and, and it doesn't matter where it is uh, in the world because there's internet everywhere now. So the, it's the first uh, industry that is totally location agnostic and scalable and that is entirely sensitive to the price of energy. And so what does that do? Well, to follow Harry's example, I mean, it improves energy in the same way that it improves power supply units. We're gonna figure out how to get energy out of the niches of the natural world in new ways that are motivated and, and cheaply uh, that are motivated by that block reward. Uh, and the competition means that all the fights that we have Justin, talking to you. <laughs> All the fights that we have about power and what's the best form of it for humanity? How do we produce it best? What, which, which of these pie in the sky ideas about our energy future as a species is really going to work? Mining is like the acid bath for any of those ideas. 
It's because you got to compete with these other miners. And if you, you, you make promises in your pitch deck about your new energy idea, about how many cents per kilowatt hour this is going to provide and how much uptime you're going to give. That doesn't matter. What matters is whether miners can actually profit on it. And they're in a zero sum game against every other miner. So it, it's like a, a global scale, perfect competition that incentivizes what humanity needs, which is cheap, abundant energy to, to power its future, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and we, yeah, uh, so, so I mean, taking a big step back, like ener energy is our, I think our energy system is probably the largest issue facing hu humanity generally, right? We're increasing our demand for energy. We've got large parts of the world that are using little energy now, but are going to use energy. Uh, how do we do that in a just way? How do we do that in a sustainable way? And how do we get people power who don't have it and improve their lives? Like, you can't find a bigger problem than that to solve or to think about. Why does energy density per capita matter? Well, it's just hard to do the things we want without it. The tool of human flourishing. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's being able to go to the hospital. It's being able to feed yourself and your family. It's being able to travel. It's like correlated to every biomarker of a successful civilization. Infant mortality, education rates, literacy rates. Like pick, pick any societal biomarker. And energy density per capita correlates like one to one with improvement. And we deserve it. We dug ourselves out of the caves for this, right? There's 50 million years of ancestors counting on us. It's urgent. Yeah, and, and at the same time, um, at the same time, you know, our energy landscape is constantly changing. Like, we cleared forests. We, um, we used the easy deposits, the cheap and, and easy kind of uh, hydrocarbon deposits, right? They're gone. It's getting more and more energy intensive to get energy out. So to keep up our, to our improvement in our human, human flourishing, we need innovation on getting more out of less and getting energy out of new sources that we haven't already done. And, and everybody has their own idea about how to do that. And of course, we have government subsidizing it. Um, we, we have a lot of partisanship in that. But I think what's beautiful about Bitcoin is mining is it just doesn't care about your feelings. It, 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 you know what I mean? It's about the bottom line in the end. It's like, that, that's very nice if you're doing that. But um, sorry, it costs you more than a Bitcoin to mine a Bitcoin. You're done. So Harry, why do you think people, hat tip New York Times, are working so hard against this? Um, I, I think, you know, if, if we take the charitable argument, you know, for on their behalf, reluctantly, um, then... They're, they're, it's just ignorance, right? Like, I, like if you if you went into the news office there and you sat down with every reporter who worked on that or every reporter in the bullpen and just asked, like, how does energy get generated and delivered? Like, nobody can answer, right? So you're you're fundamentally asking people with no technical basis to comment on the moralization of the usage, and that's not a fair assignment. And and so that's sort of one one leg of it, and the the other is just you know that there's there's a, a, a moral superiority that, that's been represented about one use case of energy versus another, and, and that's wrong, right? Like, we, we have a market for this thing. Um, everybody pays their power bill at the end of the month, you know, whether you're a, a huge Bitcoin miner or whether you're a household, and the ability to freely associate within the context of that marketplace, you know, is, is what, you know, what we as Americans have come to understand we have a right to. So now tell the truth. Or there's just like a massive political biased agenda coming for us. <laughs> one of the two. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> it's a news office. And, and, and let's dig into the reasons why. Because like there's really a very, very reasonable fact-based way to approach this. Where if you just look at the list of power plants and mining facilities listed, they just omit all the big good ones. Right. It's, it's like it's like it's just the, the least reasonable cohort to be able to represent one point of view. You want to talk about marginal accounting for emissions? We can go there next. But that's like the most egregious, egregious methodology that we could think of. But like if you just go look at a holistic list 
you don't end up with the data set that they've arrived at. You've just excluded everything that touches a, re a renewable generation source. And, and, and look, like I can cherry pick data to say whatever I want. Uh, that piece was um, devastating to me uh, because I just knew what the response of my uh, colleagues and friends and acquaintances would be. And sure enough, my inbox was full. Uh, Troy, uh, I don't know if you've seen the story. I'm guessing you probably have. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's, good, it's good to see data on what uh, Bitcoin's actual emissions are. Uh, yeah, so it was, a, I don't know. I'm so frustrated I can, I can barely think straight still about that story. I talked to the reporter as many Bitcoiners did, had a, uh, actually a really hard but productive 90 minute conversation in, with Gabriel Danson. I, I don't know, uh, Harry, uh, whether it's just ignorance because uh, this reporter seemed very smart and seemed to be tracking well. Uh, I, I don't know what happened in the editorial process or the writing process, but I think that someone was hunting a white whale, a great white whale for six months and gathering data and um, they, they got their whale. And, uh, and, and we'll, we'll try to ride that, that story to uh, accolades in journalism and so on. It's just a better story. Here's one story. Uh, what's the impact of Bitcoin mining? Well, it's kind of complicated, really. <laughs> like, uh, just you've already lost your audience. It, it's kind of complicated, really. It, it's actually very good for grid stability. Um, these are it, it, they, these are large consumers of power, but they pay very little for power, so they usually use energy that others don't want in a kind of nine rival way. There are exceptions to that when we have a spike up in prices and. Then they'll just stay on all the time, and so there'll be some communities that have, have pricier power because of it, blah, blah, right? The, give, you could give the whole picture. Is that a story you want to read? You're already bored right now. I'm losing, I'm losing you. <laughs> like, like, of course, the New York Times is going to lose its readership. Here's a story. Bitcoin is destroying the planet. It's a bunch of, uh, it's a bunch of rank capitalists who have yeah. no concern for Woo! anybody else's welfare. They just want to get rich. And, uh, and, and let's, let's, yeah, get them out of our country, never mind where they will go, and save our planet. That's a much better story. And so it was just, I think, um, I think the data was pushed to fit that story. And then that's the, the ways in which the data was massaged, the selective attention. We could be here all night to talk about it. But, you know, the, the headline was written before the story was my impression. The story was written to meet the headline. It, it's, it's a shame. We're going to be fighting it for a long time. But ultimately, we will win because we have the truth. And because the farther this narrative is from reality, like when we start showing people what, what Bitcoin mining is doing for our, for our energy systems in, cre in creative and cool ways that blow their minds, they're, they're going to be like, what? Heads absolutely spinning because they've been led to believe the exact opposite. So the real Pulitzer Prize is to be written on how we went from, how, how did we get here? How did we get government, academia, and media all on the same page, singing the same tune about a brand new emerging technology that nobody even freaking understands, really, before they write about it, and we get a moral crusade and that issues in policy proposals uh, that, that could, you know, actually, like, delay the energy goals that the very same people have. That's the story. How did that happen to I, our society? Somebody I can tell you. That. I have a great answer. <laughs> great answer. Which is, those are cohorts that fundamentally do not build things. Bitcoin demonetizes... <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin demonetizes the political class, and it re-monetizes the productive class. That's it. That's the point. And so when, you know, the heuristic for us to walk out of here with is if you look at people who are making an argument around how to cut a pie versus somebody who's willing to bake a pie, listen to the second group, please. I'm the pie cutter right here. <laughs> Not anymore. Not All right, we're going to open up for a Q&A shortly, but I've got one last question I wanted to touch on very quickly, just very quickly, is on ordinals. Uh, I haven't met a miner yet who dislikes them. Um, <laughs> Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, hands if you dislike ordinals. Hands up. Hands up if you like ordinals. Hands up if you're indifferent. 
Hands up if you were too scared to put your hand up and didn't put your hand up. Okay, yeah, I'm kind of in the indifferent camp. Just very short. Ordinals, good, bad, don't matter. Uh, ordinals are in consensus transactions, right? Like the Bitcoin software that everybody's running on their own nodes is, is their sovereign version of what they're willing to include in an accepted block that gets propagated to them. Nothing in the ordinal spec and nothing in the BRC20 spec is an out of consensus transaction. And therefore, I don't have a moral right to comment on it. Please pay me your fees. As I said, I've never met a miner who dislikes ordinals. All right, listen, I just had to ask that. Right, we've got a mic here. Just uh, our lessons from previous shows. Uh, we, we invite questions. Uh, please don't give us your life story. Um, just, I know it's great for you, but we've got limited time. If you want to come and ask a question for any of our esteemed guests, just come up around here. There's a mic. Don't be scared. Here we go. Go on, Blake. I tried to get him on the pod. Hey, guys. Uh, how are you thinking about jurisdictional risk? So, Harry, how is it to be a miner in the United States right now looking at five-year plan versus another country? Um, it's really tricky, uh, f first and foremost. So, number one is that there's sort of federal risk and there's country jurisdictional considerations. You know, the next is like state by state, region by region. You know, New York is not Texas, is not Tennessee, is not Washington. So, you know, there's, there's some significant kind of balkanization within our environment as well. Um, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing for us to do is build the most productive business we know how. And right now, that means publicly listing on U.S. exchanges to the best of our ability and trying to sign power contracts in the country that has the best property rights in the world. Fair answer. I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So no one knows my name. All right. Uh, so I was, yeah, I had a question for uh, Harry and Troy. Uh, in terms of just uh, Bitcoin mining and generation, where do you see things going, uh, perhaps in terms of nuclear? And, and other alternatives, Harry, there you go. Right, ready? A little, little, little nuke meat for me. Yeah. Um, we love the isotope. We think that nuclear power is just like a similarly, you know, societally unlocking technology, similar to hard money. Um, I think it's, it's like a, a total travesty how we've stunted that industry over the last 60 years. And we've basically done so on the back of, of you know, fear and disinformation but the facts of nuclear generation bear themselves out all over. Are they the perfect solution in every power market? Of course not. But I would expect, you know, massively more nuclear generation to exist 50 years from now if we win. Yeah. I, Hi. I, I have a less informed take that matches, uh, that, that matches Harry's. Um, I, I've been weighing into this nuclear, anti-nuclear debates within the energy space and I got to say it is like among the most intense fights I have ever witnessed people are ready to like go to the mat on the, on this question and uh, and it's difficult to get to the bottom of it I'm glad we have bitcoin as a way of deciding this contest that does not involve language but involves sats and electrons uh, what do you, this is a weird question. What do you think about consumer mining embedded in solar systems so they can use the excess credits that are wasted now? Can I try this one? So, yeah, uh, I'm hopeful about this application. It depends on some factors. It depends on, first of all, uh, CapEx being low enough, right? Because you have competing spots for those miners that have high uptime. I mean, here, here's what we have. Miners all want high uptime and low cost. And there are some sources that will give you both. The question is, how much of that is there in the world that gives you super cheap power that is always up? Miners will obviously take that before they go to uh, solar setups uh, that, are, that are not 24-7. And then the question is, which do you give up? Do you uh, give up some uptime and go with excess solar where your power is free, but you have limited uptime? Or do you pay more and stay up all the time? And that's going to be a question that you have to model out with your CapEx and how much it's depreciating, right? So in the long term, I think absolutely, think about it. In the long term, the cost of, of mining is gonna go to the cost of producing those ASICs and that's only gonna go down. And in the long term, the margins are gonna be super tight in mining as we find cheaper and cheaper and cheaper power. 
And we, we're going to have older equipment sitting around as we age out of it. And the improvement in ASICs is also going to decrease, I think. I don't yes. know Blake's laughing at me, so maybe I'm wrong. But in time, I think you're going to have cheap chips sitting around waiting for excess power wherever it exists. And that's going to include, like, all the solar power, for instance, that's DC that never makes it to AC even. There's just trapped behind there. We'll probably find a way to get that into, into ASICs without ever going through an AC conversion and back to DC, right? Is a tr if you, when you see how much clip power there is, it's absolutely stunning, uh, it, it, especially given that solar, whether you like it or not, uh, is going to explode. We're gonna have in loads of wasted energy uh, of all kinds in the system because of its intermittency. And then you'd be a fool not to mine with it because it's gonna be free, Thank but you. maybe not right now. My name's Troy. I'm just a philosopher. I don't know anything technical about anything. <laughs> Hello, uh, Chester from uh, All4. We do environmental consulting. Uh, really appreciated your perspective last year on the ESG panel and the mining stage. Uh, talk to me about how uh, ESG is a bit of a curse word, I know, but um, uh, a lot of publicly traded companies are going to be doing some reporting. Talk about how uh, mining uh, and ESG are, are, are more friends than, than enemies, maybe frenemies. Well, uh, yeah, this is a delicate subject. You, this word, ESG, I've discovered, uh, it, you know, it has a symbolic function and, um, and political meaning. And a lot of states are passing anti-ESG laws that don't allow their pensions to look at ESG factors and so on. Um, I think that uh, it's going to be mandatory that uh, public mining companies uh, report their scope one, two, three emissions, right? Whether we like it or not, it's just going to be part of the the job is coming down the pike. And so miners need to be thinking about it uh, and planning for it. And uh, you can talk to Chester here about how you may wanna, wanna do that. Uh, I think we have a really great story to tell. Um, we have to tell it on our own terms. Um, Bitcoin's uh, superpower really is its flexibility and the contributions that come from being able to turn on and off quickly. And we need to find ways to translate that story into reports that you know people will recognize will understand and recognize, and that's not an easy job, right? Uh, and the same goes for the other things that we do, capturing methane, reusing waste heat. Um, Bitcoin miners contribute to sustainability, uh, to, to you know, the E the e side of the ESG in a lot of different ways. That's, a, that's kind of like one of those things that we'll look back on in four years. We will have very sophisticated ways of translating what we do for the grid and for the environment that we don't have now. So, if, you know, if you're looking for a market to get into or something to do with your time, you know, that's an excellent project to work on. There's huge, going to be huge demand for it, and it's going to require a lot of ingenuity and skill. I just, I just want to offer some framing, which is that I think the reason that ESG ends up being this sort of third rail thing is because, on the one hand, it's a very reasonable set of objectives to stand behind, but on the other hand, gets used as a cudgel to pick winners and losers, choose outcomes. You know, look, SBF had one of the highest ESG ratings ever. So, you know, we've, we've seen sort of the misuse of the characterizations, the quantity, you know, the quantity or the, the, the qualitative and quantitative metrics that get associated with it. And so when we talk about like reporting regulations, that's one thing. But when we talk about sort of the political implementation of these types of, of metrics and values, like that's another thing. Well, it's a scam and it's a tool of control. And don't hate me, please. I'm, I'm not an advocate for ESG in any particular form. I do think that we do have a, a story to tell. There are investors who want to know that story, uh, who care, and it will invest differentially depending on how, how you run your business. Some of it's just about being good neighbors, you know, just about being good neighbors in a broader sense. <laughs> hey guys, uh, I had a quick question. Uh, so do you have any concern about mining in the future in the US reaching a point where the state may ask you to censor certain transactions or there may be laws that pass that attack Bitcoin mining? Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because you had mentioned how what mining, you know, wasn't, there wasn't really much to mining before 2019. I think you specifically meant the U.S., right? Because China was massive. a big, massive. massive. I mean, that, that's where all the mining was. That's a great point. Right. So, and I, I, and I know, I know you know that, right? Like, but, and, and obviously what happened there, you know, was banned. And so, so my question is like, yeah, like the censoring of transactions, like how, 
do you th- are, are you concerned minors will be willing to go along, and, and or are they like mobile enough that they would leave the area? I don't. I mean, it's, it's kind of hypothetical, but it has happened in a sense in China. Yeah, I think I think just to to think about it at, at a higher level, just briefly, like the the great thing right now is that you know the miners aren't particularly involved in constructing block templates that include transactions. We get fed those by automation and optimization software tools outside of our house. And so we're, we're a service provider selling compute, and we don't have any role to play today in individual transaction inclusion. That could change in a world where Stratum V2 gets rolled out, which is also a positive thing for, for the space, I think. But you're, you're asking a deep and nuanced question that I think is, is philosophical in asking, but, in, but it's technical in answering. And so I think, you know, the levers of control and, and the means by which to avoid those levers of control haven't particularly been built yet. Uh, that's a great answer. I'm going to give you a shallower answer. <laughs> um, but I've seen in the past few weeks um, Carol House speak on a couple of occasions and had conversations with her. And she's the former head of cybersecurity for the National Security Council and has held numerous positions in the White House. And she was very clear, and this is not like her opinion. I think she's the most Bitcoin, was the most Bitcoin friendly person we had in the White House. But she was just very clear that that, uh, wow, is that a bat? Wow, amazing. Uh, we have a bat in here. <laughs> uh, Spook. Uh, but uh, she was very clear that like, there are a number of options that they have on the table for uh, making sure that money is not used improperly from their perspective. And they want to take sort of the most egregious case, like uh, someone buying weapons of mass destruction or something from North Korea. And then they're going to say, uh, they're going to say, hey, hey, guys, uh, can, can you just uh, not process this, this transaction? And uh, it, there, what they would like is for us, this is, this, I'm going to quote her. This is from the Princeton conference. She said, what we need is for all of you to get the relevant people in a room and make this decision for yourselves so we don't have to make it for you. And I was like, my panel was next, and the panel title was um, a question. It was like, if Bitcoin is the answer, to what question is it the answer? Or if Bitcoin is the answer, what is the question? And I was like, the question is, can you invent a kind of money in which there is no, for which there is no room that you can get all the relevant players in and do the thing that, that the White House wants us to do? That's what Bitcoin is. It's a technology that doesn't have that room, right? Um, take but, it up with the CEO. Take it up with the CEO, right? There is no room. There is no room. And, and what's amazing was that they think only in those terms. And for every other kind of protocol that was represented in that room, there could some of the people were in fact in that room. You know, like Joe Lubin was there sitting in the front. So like, you, you know, you, could, you can round up the relevant people, but you can't for Bitcoin. So I think we're on a collision course and maybe it'll be settled politically. Maybe it'll settle, you know, in elections. Maybe it'll be settled legally. They know how extreme this is, and and it's the idea is not just like censoring blocks from a transaction, but censoring you from mining on top of a chain that has it somewhere deeper, right? Because if, if it's just censoring, it'll get in from miners elsewhere. And it, 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 but but if they say you can't mine on top of a chain that has this transaction in it, then it's effectively saying you can't mine Bitcoin in the U.S. It's a disaster scenario. It's kind of on the calendar for me, kind of in the way that like the, the Department of Defense has the war with China on the calendar. It's like <laughs> it's, it's on the calendar. I don't, I don't know when, but maybe it's like 2030 or something. Uh, they're just going to do that. And I think we should we have to we have to prepare for it politically, legally and technically. OK, we've got time for one more question. Can we and let's keep it quick. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask. Uh, since I'm really interested in this idea that Bitcoin can reveal what energy sources are actually good and actually optimal, but I fear that that will be distorted by things like, you know, subsidies and over-regulations on things. And, you know, any government can make any energy source look good to Bitcoin miners and have them all use the worst energy source possible just by taxing and subsidizing. It's already happening. It's happening all over the place. Bitcoin, <laughs> sorry, I'm just jumping right no, into this. Let's thing. keep it quick as well. Yeah, Bitcoin is, is a black hole. One of the things that sucks in is subsidies. If, if you subsidize energy and make it artificially cheap, whether it's coal in Kazakhstan or in, in Kentucky, like 
uh, Bitcoin miners will come and absorb it. And yes, we're not completely outside the system. That's a really good concern. It absolutely does happen. I just think those subsidies are not sustainable and Bitcoin will destroy the subsidies over the time and replace it with a natural one. That yeah. All right, a big thanks to Harry. Big, big thanks to Troy.